Great. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jen Miroff. I'm the Legislative Action Chair for the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts. And we want to welcome you and thank you for joining us tonight for Act for Change, Farm Bill 2023, Farming, Climate, and You. Uh, we are recording this presentation and you will be posting it to our League of Women Voters of Massachusetts YouTube channel. So this program is presented by Nancy Polin, a board member of the Northampton Area League and Maria Bartlett, member at large. We thank them for their hard work and dedication on this mission critical issue and for preparing this stellar presentation this evening. Nancy and Maria are longtime climate activists and avid gardeners. They are members of the National Food, Soil and Agriculture Team, which is one of 10 LWVUS climate interest groups. So before we begin, I want to review the League's community norms. We ask that you be respectful, assume positive intent, but understand impact, bring your full self and limit distractions. Feel free to message me with any personal questions or concerns during the presentation. And with regard to questions, Nancy and Maria will take questions at the end of the presentation and we'll use, we'll follow the raise hand feature for that. So we'd ask you to raise your hand at the end of the presentation and we can call on you to unmute. So with that, I will turn it over to Nancy. So Nancy, I'm gonna spotlight you and then I will share my screen for the slides. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Jen. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm very happy to be here to talk about the Farm Bill. This is a rare opportunity to advocate for national legislation because most of our advocacy centers on state legislation. We have received permission from the National League to conduct this webinar on the Farm Bill because of its investment in practices to help combat climate change. The 2023 Farm Bill can become an historic climate law, but only if environmental and conservation initiatives are fully funded and farmers are incentivized to use climate smart practices. Next slide, please. Here is the agenda for the program. First, I will explain what the Farm Bill is and why we are taking action to support it. Next, I will talk about the environmental and economic benefits of climate smart agriculture. I will explain the Farm Bill Action Alert, which is to write to legislators, urging them to support fully funding the climate smart practices and conservation in the Farm Bill. Next week, an action alert will be emailed to all league members with the recording of this meeting and a fact sheet. After we've talked about the action alert, then M Maria is here to tell you about the food based toolkit that was made by the National League Food, Soil, and Ag team. Next slide. The Farm Bill is omnibus legislation that addresses multiple issues. It's really a bundle of bills one for each of the topics in the list on the slide. And each one is given a title and a number. Commodities is title one, conservation is title two, and so on. Tonight, we'll, we will be talking about title two, the conservation bill. Much of the farm bill is based on the original bills that were written in the 1930s to help farmers recover from the dust bowl. Farm bills are revised every five or six years. The Farm Bill of 2023 is revising, re, revising the last bill from 2018. So the greatest debate now in Congress is how to distribute the funding for all of those programs. Only a few like the commodities and nutrition programs are mandated. 
the funding for the other programs fluctuate each year when Congress approves the annual budget for the following year. And in the last five years, the conservation budget has been reduced. The pie chart shows how funds were distributed in the 2018 Farm Bill. The blue portion of the pie chart is the largest at 76%. And that goes to fund nutrition programs like the SNAP program and WIC and the free school breakfast and lunch programs. Conservation is that yellow piece of the pie, which only got 6.8% of the funds. That's the area that we want to grow. Next slide. Early this year, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed and with it, a $20 billion fund for climate smart agriculture and conservation. Climate activists, activists including LWV, know that that $20 billion is a game changer for farming. And we want to be sure that it is truly used for climate friendly agriculture. In February this year, the LWV US signed on to a letter along with nearly 650 other organizations urging leaders of the House and the Senate Agriculture Committees to protect that 21, 20 billion climate smart investment allocated in the Inflation Reduction Act. Some members of Congress are questioning the need to increase conservation funding. Some members are even eyeing the Farm Bill as a chance to redirect climate smart agriculture money to increasing crop subsidies and insurance programs for commodity crops such as corn and soy, while other conservative lawmakers want across the board spending cuts. The role of the league is to educate and advocate for the importance of fully funding the environmental investment in the farm bill. Important for the health of the planet, a sustainable farming system, for food security for every American, and a robust profitable farms here in Massachusetts. Next slide. The UN IPCC sixth assessment report in 2022 stated that changes in agriculture and food systems and forest receptors together could provide nearly one third of the greenhouse gas reduction needed to meet the UN's target. Worldwide and in the US, the agriculture industry is the single largest emitter of both methane and nitrous oxide. Both of those gases are very powerful greenhouse gases, far more so than CO2. Methane is emitted primarily by livestock. Think of cow burps and manure management. Nitrous oxide comes from the use of fertilizers. The good news, with some changes in practices, firms can not only reduce their greenhouse gases drastically, but they can actually become carbon negative. That is, firms can be used to sequester carbon. Next slide. Good farm policy is based on two forms of conservation. First, to conserve farmlands from development. We are losing six acres of farmland to development in Massachusetts every day. We have to reverse that. Second, to conserve and improve farm soil for greater productivity. Both forms of conservation must be fully funded in a 23 farm bill. 
That is the league's primary message to fully fund the conservation programs. Major USDA conservation programs, like the Conservation Stewardship Program, have notoriously long waiting lists. About three quarters of the farmers who apply for those programs cannot get funding. Imagine 75% of the farmers are turned away. In March, a group of farmers from Massachusetts went to Washington and joined farmers from across the country. They joined in a climate rally and met with legislators to ask for climate change policy to be a priority in the 23 Farm Bill. Sarah Voiland, an organic farmer from Montague, Mass, said, we want to join in asking Congress to help diversified organic farms like ours withstand increasingly erratic weather, like the record rainfall that drowned our crops in 2021 and a subsequent drought in 2022. As a gardener, I can relate to that erratic weather. Two summers ago in in July, I remember we got 19 inches of rain in Southampton, and many of my plants got moldy and died. And then last summer, we had the opposite, when we didn't get hardly a drop of rain all through August and September. And this winter was rather erratic, too. It was relatively mild this winter, but then was punctuated by that extreme cold for a few days. One night it went down to 17 below here in Southampton. And then we had some late frosts. And it's been reported that because of that, our peach crops in Western Mass have been totally destroyed. The apple crops were damaged too, but some of them were, have survived. So we are seeing the effects of the erratic weather. It's stressing our plants, stressing our trees, and super stressing our farmers. Next slide. For every dollar spent growing food, Massachusetts farmers on average earn only 94 cents. Many farmers, have to rely on second jobs just to break even. Farmers have read the reports and they know that adopting climate smart practices can increase farm profits. One study by the Soil Health Institute surveyed 100 farmers across the country. These are farmers who used no-till and cover crops for five years. The profits for the corn farmers in the study rose 85%. The profits for the soybean farmers rose 88%. And 97% of the farmers reported increased crop resilience to the extreme weather. Transition to organic and regenerative farming practices, however, is expensive, especially for small to mid-sized farmers like here in Massachusetts. And most farmers lose money during the first few years of the transition. What they need is money, education, and technical support from the conservation program in the Farm Bill. Next slide, please. Not all climate smart practices are equally effective. Some boost industrial agriculture profits at the expense of the climate. The best climate smart practices improve soil health and store carbon. Healthy soils support a living ecosystem with myriad forms of microorganisms, insects, and fungi all working together to sequester carbon 
and recycled minerals to make them available for crops. By 2060, in less than 40 years, our soils will be asked to give us as much food as we have consumed in the last 500 years. American farms are rapidly losing for fertile soil. In some areas, 50% of the soil has been lost over the last century. Iowa is currently losing soil faster than at the height of the 1930s Dust Bowl. We can reverse soil loss with healthy soil practices, but they must be adapted by many more farmers across the country. In 2017, climate smart practices were used on just 10% of US cropland. Massachusetts farmers are starting to adopt them. We see that here in the Pioneer Valley but we have to get many more farmers on board. Next slide, please. The use of zero to low tillage and cover crops keeps soil covered and minimally disturbed. That's the primary goal of these strategies. I like this photo on the slide because it shows the farm workers are harvesting and planting at the same time. There's no chance for any area of the soil to be exposed. The initial decision by the federal court panel to strike down- The no-till planter in the upper right-hand corner is an enlargement that shows small grooves in the soil. And it drops uh, as the- Machine moves along, it drops seeds into those small grooves. And you see the residual plants from the last harvest are still on the ground and they're providing natural mulch. The roots of the harvested plants stay there, add carbon to the soil and allow more rain to sink into the ground. Next slide, please. The use of crop rotation and cover crops together provide multiple environmental and economic benefits. Crop yields increase because the soil is healthier. You can see the picture of the farm in the background of this slide is diversified. Each colored stripe represents a different crop. There are many different crops which are rotated to different fields each year. Soil erosion is greatly reduced when the fields are continually covered with those crops. Contrast this with conventional farming for growing, say, corn, which is harvested, then the fields are plowed, leaving the ground bare and exposed to serious soil erosion for several months. Current commodity pricing and crop insurance make those conventional practices more profitable, which is why farmers keep using them. Increasing incentives in the farm bill for more diversified crops and using cover crops on smaller farms would make a huge difference and attract many more farmers to adopt those practices. Insect pests and plant pathogens are usually very specific to particular plants. So there's a real benefit in planting a variety of crops because it reduces the overall damage from insect pests and pathogens. As a result, fewer pesticides are needed. Then the pollinator populations explode Wildlife habitat increases. Sometimes farmers plant cash crops over clover, like sunflowers, and that attracts the pollinators and birds and other wildlife. It's a win-win all around. Next slide.
I got the inspiration for this slide a few days ago when I pulled a large clover plant out of my garden. It reminded me of a time when I was teaching and I would take clover plants into my high school biology labs and told students about these bacterial heroes on the clover roots. We owe our very existence to those bacteria. That really impressed my students. And I suddenly realized that mm, bacteria are not so boring. <laughs> so I dug up this plant, took pictures of the clover roots with their nitrogen fixing nodules, which are kind of small on the clover roots. Um, soybean plants, and alfalfa and some of the other legumes have much larger nitrogen fixing nodules, but at least you can see them, I think, here. Legumes and clover add nitrogen to the soil. The atmosphere contains lots of nitrogen, but it's in a form that cannot be used by most plants or animals. The nodules on the roots of the legumes like clover and soybeans are filled with masses of nitrogen fixing bacteria called rhizobia bacteria. This is a symbiotic relationship. The plant provides sugars for the bacteria and the bacteria convert nitrogen into a form that the plant can use to make proteins and DNA. Then those useful plant proteins are eaten by people or cattle, cows, or pigs that provide protein-rich foods for us and other animals. If farmers leave those plants in the ground and the roots are allowed to decay, that adds a lot of the useful form of nitrogen to the soil and makes it available for crops for the next year. The result, farmers need much less fertilizer. On the slides, you can see an example with corn. When using conventional farming methods, farmers usually need about 120 pounds of fertilizer per acre. Corn grown with cover crop require just three to 20 pounds. That's a huge reduction and a big savings for the pharma. Next slide. Now let's talk about the action alert. Today we're asking Massachusetts League members to reach out to our members of Congress, urging them to vote to fully fund the conservation and climate smart practices in this year's farm bill. That includes the $20 billion funding for Climate Smart Ag from the IRA. This is a huge once in a lifetime commitment to transitioning to climate friendly agriculture. This is important. This is an important message that we want our legislators to recognize. So please join me and email or call our legislators Senators Markey and Senator Warren, and Representative Jim McGovern. It's especially important to reach out to Jim McGovern because he's a longtime member of the House Committee on Agriculture. We ask that you limit your message to what is in the letter to the House and Senate Agriculture Committees that was co-signed by the National League. To read the letter, you can scan this QR code on the slide, or next week, it will come uh, as a link in the action alert that we're sending out. Next slide, please. So we're sending out the action alert on June 13th with everything you'll need to take action. There will be the recording of this webinar, a fact sheet, which has all of the legislators' emails, some talking points, and a sample letter here on the slide. 
You are encouraged to personalize the letter, but keep it to our main message. There are also uh, included a lot of references if you're interested in further reading. And that's it. If you have more questions about the action alert, I can answer them later. Now I'll turn this over to Maria, who can tell you all about the Food Waste Toolkit. Good evening. Can people hear me? Yes. OK, good. Uh, the food, soil, and agriculture team that Nancy and I are part of uh, with the League of Women Voters of US uh, focused on soil and agriculture with this uh, action alert on the farm bill. The other part of our, of our focus is on food and we developed this food waste toolkit to address that, ish, that aspect of our focus. Um, next slide, please. Are you okay? More than 30% of the food produced in the US is wasted. It is never consumed. That's unbelievable to me. And despite all of this wasted food, millions of people in the US, including children, are food insecure. There's a renewed effort across the US to redirect what would be wasted food to those who are food insecure. And the pandemic really showed everyone how fragile our food distribution network is. I believe it's something like 35 million Americans are considered food insecure. And the food waste toolkit does address how to redirect some of this wasted food to those who are food insecure. Next slide. Wasted food equals wasted resources from energy to labor, to water, to the fertilizers that are used to grow the food. Just how much is wasted? The emissions released in producing wasted food is equal to that from 42 coal fired power plants burning for a year and the water used could supply 50 million homes enough water for a year. These are staggering amounts. And those numbers don't even include the greenhouse gas emissions that come when the wasted food is sent to the landfill. Next slide. To put this in perspective, the methane emissions from the municipal solid waste landfills in 2020 were equal to the greenhouse gas emissions from about 20 million passenger cars driven for one year, or the CO2 emissions from the energy used by 12 million homes for a year. So reducing our food waste can have a huge impact on climate change by greatly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Food choices matter. We know this, not just for planetary health, but for human health as well. Many credit a vegan diet with po many positive health benefits. We have to change. We have to eat more foods that are lower on the food chain. As the population grows, our planet cannot provide the resources needed for a diet with a lot of meat. Meat production uses more resources and is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than any other food product. And you can see on this chart how, how outrageously out of whack the emissions are, especially for beef. In New York City, food is responsible for 20% of the city's emissions, rivaling transportation as a source of planet warming gases. The mayor, Eric Adams, recently vowed to reduce the emissions tied to city food procurements by a third by 2030. 
Already, New York City public schools serve meatless lunches on Mondays and Fridays to help in this effort. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Whoops. OK, great. Uh, leagues can and are making a difference. They're educating uh, members about the impacts of their food choices, like we're doing tonight. They're supporting efforts to end food deserts and make healthy food accessible to all. They're advocating for cities to join Meatless Mondays efforts. And some are publishing a vegan recipe in every newsletter. The Food Ways Toolkit includes many more suggestions and resources for educating and advocacy. Ideas include ways to gather and redistribute ex excess food to those in need. How to work with municipal leaders to set up community composting programs. And many ideas on specific individual actions we can take. Next slide. Here is the list of resources that we used for this presentation. I'd like to highlight the Massachusetts Healthy Soil Action Plan. This was released six months ago and is the first such plan in the US and other states are looking at this uh, as, a, as a way to uh, go forward themselves. I would also like to draw your attention to the three documentaries listed here. All of them are interesting and inspirational pieces. Watching them conveys very well the vital importance of building and conserving healthy soil. And I, there are a couple of people on this webinar tonight from my garden club, the Andover Garden Club. And we showed um, Kiss the Ground at one of our meetings and uh, had a discussion afterwards. And it was very uh, informative, very interesting. And people really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Next slide, please. So please consider joining the food, soil, and agriculture team. We are ably led by active members in California. And the team includes others from states across the rest of the country. You can contact us using the email address or the QR code. And I'd just like to mention one additional thing. I got an email yesterday um, and it was about a, a very interesting cookbook that someone has just developed. Uh, the author is Tamar Adler. The cookbook is called Everlasting Meal Cookbook, Leftovers A to Z. And what she is focused on in this cookbook is using leftovers that tend to end up in the back of your refrigerator and then get thrown out and how to use them in very creative and delicious uh, ways um, to reduce food waste in your own kitchen. So I just thought I'd let you know about that everlasting meal cookbook. So that's, so thank you. That's our, um, our presentation and now we can answer your questions. Great, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Maria. I know I learned so many things I had no idea before. So I'm grateful for you sharing your knowledge. I'm going to put us into a view where we can all see each other. Let's see, I'm gonna remove your spotlight, I think first. And then we can go into more meeting style. Great, okay. Does anyone have any questions for Nancy or Maria? If you'd like to use the raised hand feature, you can come off mute and ask them. We answered all of your questions <laughs> ahead of time. Right. What do you, what, can I ask a question? What do you think? People, what do you think you might be able to do based on our presentation? <laughs> I guess. See if there's any questions. Okay. 
Sue? Sue has a question. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say one thing that I think we can do locally here is uh, I work with the programs committee for Amherst neighbors and I'm going to get Ryan Voiland, who was one of my neighbors when I lived up in Montague, uh, oh. Ryan and Sarah, and I'm going to have them come and talk and, you know, over Zoom, it's, it's so easy to do that. And do that to increase some awareness locally and share the toolkit also with that network if that's okay with the people who created the toolkit oh yeah no it's it's supposed to be it's supposed to be used by everyone who wants to use it it has a lot it's some of it was based on some of the other toolkits um epa usda but it's it has a lot of really good suggestions in it, especially it's not always easy to figure out how to redistribute excess food from restaurants or wherever. And it has some really good suggestions and resources on how to do that if you wanted to do that in your community. It also has, um, in Massachusetts, there are some towns now starting to do uh, community composting. I think Hamilton uh, is doing it on, on a community-wide basis. Other towns have where you can sign up to individually have Good Earth come and pick up your scraps and stuff. But I think Hamilton is doing, is the only town maybe that's doing community-wide. But it's that, they're the early ones. Uh, Andover is considering doing it. We already have a composting facility where we could do it. So, you know, this is the wave of the future. This is what San Francisco, a lot of a lot of cities are already doing this. Great. Thanks, Sue. That's a good idea. Susan? Um, two things. One, uh, for those in the North Shore area, Black Earth does a really great job of composting. And the city of Beverly um, has a contract with them. Um, oh. but yeah, and and um, it's not particularly expensive. It's I think uh, less than two hundred dollars a year to have them come every week and pick up your compost. And it, they take everything from uh, chicken bones and lobster shells to your flower arrangements that you're throwing away. And they'll do they'll do um, textiles and uh, yard waste for a small additional fee. But um, and they're spreading all over the this region, so uh, every, people can look into that. The other is that as of today, I read that um, the New York City Council has just passed a. Hold on, I'm going to find it. Um, the the City Council passed a bill on Thursday requiring New Yorkers to separate their food waste from regular trash with mandatory composting coming to all five boroughs by next year. Yeah, that's what San Francisco, the whole Bay Area already has that. But if New York City can do it, come on guys. Everybody yeah. can do it. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That's a great update. Thank you, Susan. Are there any other questions for Nancy and Maria? One thing I'd like to add, if we've got a minute or two, oh, yeah. is that the Farm Bill has um, programs that really could use a whole lot more funding for rural communities, for programs like uh, Farm to School, where mm -hmm. specific farms produce food for the high school or the elementary schools. Um, or farm to hospital, or farm to community centers, and farmers markets. And out here in Western Mass, um, there have been a couple of um, mobile farm markets starting up that are driving around through the hill towns. For people who can't get to a farmer's market, uh, they're taking the food to them. Um, 
So there are a lot of innovative uh, programs for entrepreneurs and, and people who are really trying to provide more local food to more people, including to a lot of our students. Uh, we're in the five colleges area and every once in a while we read about all of the college students who are, so many of them are food insecure. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a good way, like I know UMass Amherst has a, a great farm and they just take that, that food that they grow on their farm and, and take it right over to the uh, community center and, 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 you know, use it. Uh, but not all the students have access to good local food that they can afford. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, Susan um, Prendergast uh, just put said that Cambridge has a Rena, city mm -hmm. composting. Is that required, uh, Rena? Is it? Uh, is it uh, mandatory that people separate the food? It's not mandatory, but everyone's received a free compost bucket and the city picks it up every week with our trash. And, um, you know, they just pick it up every week from everyone who wants okay. to participate. And I, they have the statistics on, I think something like 50% participate at this point and they're looking to increase that. I'm not sure about the specific, I just got an email about what specifics are, but it has changed. The other question I had is that um, in your, I don't know if it's in your um, program or not, you put together is the Good Samaritan bill or the Good Samaritan uh, process by which somebody who donates food does is not responsible for that food if, if something happens to it, which is important to a lot of restaurants who might want to donate no. their excess food but they don't to want to be shelter. held liable for anything sorry they don't want to be liable right and there is a bill in there is a um a legal you know there is a law in place that the good samaritan bill protects them so that should be part of your presentation if it's not already that's an excellent yeah. point good to know. thank you rena thank you rena mm -hmm. martha did you have a question Yes. <laughs> Hello. Very nice and interesting presentation. Uh, thank you for doing that. I just wanted to mention I'm a member of Amherst's Solar Bylaw Working Group. We're working on uh, trying to you know, create a, a zoning law that will encourage uh, and at the same time regulate uh, solar installations here. And tomorrow at our meeting at noontime, we are going to have a special session describing the potentials for dual use solar on agricultural land. Uh, there's a quite a research program at UMass uh, here in Amherst on that. And anyway, this program is open to the public. I don't know whether anybody would be interested, but if so, I could, you know, I could share my screen and show the the slide with the with the link or something. If if you, anybody thought they might be interested yeah. in listening to that. Uh, Martha, I'm really glad to hear that UMass is studying it because yeah. a lot of people assume, I, I mean, one of the things that we really don't want to happen is to have farmland taken out of production yeah. for solar. Yes. Um, and it's still a little bit unclear how effectively agriculture can be combined. I mean, there's a lot of common wisdom that it will work, but there isn't a whole lot of, of uh, hard data yet. So I'm glad to hear UMass is studying it. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I agree with, with your comments. I mean, there are people who are very enthused about it, but it is a real concern as to whether um, important local food crops would be displaced in order to you, do something that 
uh, was compatible with the solar panels. You know, everybody uses the example of raising sheep, gets the sheep are happy to graze under the solar panels. But uh, we, we need our farms to produce vegetables and uh, mm -hmm. apples and the local, local crops. And certainly in Amherst, we have a thriving farmer's market, also a, a survival center where farmers <clears throat> Uh, donate excess food and so on. So it is something that's very controversial. I, I can't guarantee what the session is going to be like tomorrow, but uh, if it, if anybody is is interested, um, I... Do you have a link you can put in the chat? Yeah, can you put a in the registration link in the chat? Yes, okay, I will try to do that. I'll see if I oh, can okay. <laughs> and, and do that. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Okay. <laughs> Great idea, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Maria and Nancy? Wonderful, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As Nancy stated, we will be sending um, an action alert for the federal level to contact your federal legislators about climate smart protections in the farm bill that's going to be issued on Tuesday and it will have all everything you need to know and all the links you need in there but please feel free to contact us with any questions um can One I moment. just say Jen please, that um, there's some people maybe on um, here that are not league members mm -hmm. and they will also receive the sample letter and the action alert but yes everyone who registered by, they can modify it by saying, you know, leaving out that part where mm -hmm. it's as, as a Massachusetts League member, you know. They yes, can... that's an excellent point. That's wonderful. So we can also send it to everyone who registered for this event and they can just um, edit as they see fit. Definitely. But we would love their their action at the federal level. Oh, great. Martha did. Yes, place, I, um, I sent that, but you know, you. I'm not too good at this because I need to tell no, you. You did a great job. Time or something. Great job. Right it's, at, it's at 1130 from 1130 to one. So it's right. you know lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. Good but anyway, idea. Were, the speakers, uh, one is from you, one or two are from UMass. And I think they will also cover things like the, um, the incentives from the, from Massachusetts for installing nice. and so on again, which okay. is, you know, controversial. You don't want to take farmland out of, out right. of farming. Okay, great. Thank you, Martha. Sue, did you have another question or comment? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask Martha, which I probably could just call her on the phone, but I think <laughs> other people would also want to know, um, do people have to be registered in advance to join that Zoom or is it an open? It's it's open. And the other way to get there is if you go to amherstma.gov and then uh, you have to click on the committees and this is the solar bylaw working group. And if you click on that, eventually you find the agenda and the agenda has that link. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Yeah, that's how that's that's the same yes. process we have in Needham and Needham. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. Thanks for the question, Sue. Thank okay, you. great. Well, we thank everyone for your time. Take care, be well, stay safe, and um, stay tuned for the action alert. Good night. Thank right. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.